Welcome to Take Command, a Dale Carnegie podcast, the show where we seek to uncover what leadership means in today's world. I'm Joe Hart, CEO of Dale Carnegie, and we will be talking to diverse leaders with stories to tell across various industries to help unlock your potential for success. We will be sharing real life insights into leadership, which in turn can help spark the next level of your growth as a leader. Today's guest is someone who knows what it means to take command. After graduating from Oxford University and becoming a chartered accountant with a prominent firm in the UK, he shifted to a large automotive retailer. After that company was acquired, he lost his job, and he then started a new company in 2006 from nothing. Today, Virtue Motors is one of the top auto retailers in the UK with over four billion pounds in annual revenue. We are excited to welcome the CEO of Virtue Motors, Robert Forrester. Robert, welcome to the Take Command podcast. Hey, it's great to be invited, and it's nice to speak to somebody from so far away. It is far, and yet we're close, right? The technology makes it all so possible. So it's wonderful to have you. I mean, I know you are the CEO of Virtue Motors. You built this company up really from nothing in 2006 to over four billion pounds annually and turnover. Really an incredible story. And I want to ask you about that and certainly about, you know, you were an accountant before you started this. There's a lot that I think we can learn from you. Tell us about you, maybe some of the you know, early things that may have led to this. What led to you being here today? I think a series of historical accidents, if I'm brutally honest with you. I have no real great interest in cars. I actually like trains, railway engines more than I like cars. But I got involved in the car business about 20 years ago. I really like the car business. I think the car business is complex. It's fast. It's dynamic. There's always issues. It keeps me really busy and intellectually challenged because you're constantly dealing with a lot of inbound. And you've got to make long-term plans. So you've got the short term to deal with and then the long term to deal with. And, you know, what does the industry look like in 5, 10, 15 years time? And we're making investment decisions 15, 20 years out. And the world is fast moving, as we all know at the moment. So I think it's kept me very busy and I suspect it will keep me very busy and very interested and curious for the next 10 or 15 years. So how did you get into this line of work? Well, I went to Oxford University and studied geography. I came out and actually worked for a US-based accounting firm called Arthur Anderson, which I'm sure you've heard of. And I spent nine years there, loved business, got really involved in understanding businesses and what made them tick and saw various businesses, worked in Chicago for a while, predominantly obviously in the UK and Europe. I ended up running a property company for a couple of years and then had one of those periods of adversity, which I think can change people's lives And it really depends how you react to them. But I was actually working in a city called Manchester and I was actually seeing a doctor in Newcastle, which is about three hours away. And one night she diagnosed that I was actually dying at the age of 30 of meningitis. And she quickly over the phone diagnosed it, got me into hospital and saved my life. While I was in hospital, feeling quite weak as it happens, I decided that I would move to her region and her city. I would marry her, didn't tell her that, and I would get a job in a publicly quoted company. I was in a private company at the time, and within eight weeks, I had moved to the Northeast and got a job in a big car retailer based in the Northeast, and that's how I got into the car business. So absolutely nothing to do with the car business whatsoever. It just happened to be that was the job that I got, and I've not looked back since then, really. Well, it's a pretty incredible story. And there's a lot of things I could ask you about that. You had this adversity. I mean, you almost died. How did you face that? And what did you do in life of that? Well, I made some very quick decisions, but I actually didn't sort of agonize there, sitting there for weeks. I mean, these decisions came into my head in the space of 10 seconds. I actually think people know what they want to do. And once they've got a plan, you just go and execute it. And I decided that that's what I wanted to do with my life. And my now wife wasn't overly amused at the prospect of this bloke landing on a doorstep. But anyway, it worked out in the end. We're married and we've got three children. But I just think how you respond to adversity is really, really important because no one goes through life with a perfect run. There are always going to be setbacks. And how you handle those setbacks, it determines whether you're going to win or lose. I've had two or three major issues which could have changed 
and gone either way. And I think how you respond to that mentally, I think is just so important. What would be an example? Well, an example in having spent six years in the Northeast, first of all, as financial director and then managing director of the third largest motor retailer in the UK, automotive retailer, the equivalent of CarMax or AutoNation in the US, we got taken over by another competitor and I was fired after three minutes. And I wasn't allowed to work for 12 months under the contract. You know, that was a big thing. I'd put my heart and soul, really. I, I've always loved work. And, you know, to go home one day, actually, it was 16 years yesterday, Valentine's Day. And then not to be able to work and not really know what to do and not really wanting to move region could have been quite destabilizing. But I had some good mentors, people who helped me, who made me go to work, even though I didn't have a job and get me fresh. And then we decided within six months that actually what needed to happen was we were going to set a company up from scratch in the car business and start again. And there were two or three of us started it in November 2006. And as you say in the introduction, we sit here today with four billion pounds turnover, 6,000 employees, 159 sales outlets. And none of that would have happened had that original company not got taken over. It just would never have happened. And actually what looked at the time as a really poor situation of unemployment has actually turned into the, one of the best things that's ever happened. So in that moment, though, in those very difficult days immediately after this, I mean, it's got a happy ending, so to speak, but you talked about the adversity. How did you maintain your positive mindset or did you not? Did you find yourself having despair? There was no despair. You've got to have support mechanisms around you. You've got to have people around you who you respect, who are willing to tell you what reality is and give you advice. And I had a mentor, actually died just before Christmas, actually. I had a mentor for about 20 years who was one of the original partners at Pricewaterhouse and took me under his wing 20 years ago. Every day we would speak and he would just keep me on the straight and narrow. And I've always been blessed with people like that throughout my career, people who've taken an active interest for whatever reason, actually, in me and have developed me and coached me. And I think that is of fundamental importance. And then the other thing you've got to do is you've got to work on your mindset every day. Mindsets don't just happen. They have to be worked on. And I'm a great believer in morning routines. There's plenty written about morning routines and the exercise and the hydration and the diet and the learning and the journaling and the meditation and the affirmations and all this stuff that sounds weird, but it works. And keeping positive and keeping that, you have to work on it. It does not just happen. And I think the more you work on yourself, Everything else just sort of flows really well. To be honest. Yeah, I think this is a critical topic, Robert, right? Because I mean, everything flows from our mindset, how we respond to things. You talked about losing your job. Many people are paralyzed. Many people you know, just attach their identity to losing their job. But you, know, you had mentors, but you also had mindset. Talk a little bit more about how you strengthen your mindset. What would be an example, if you're willing to share some of the routines? That no, you- no. I mean, I wouldn't say I do this every day, but I'm pretty consistent. Where I get up early. I actually struggle a little bit with the getting up very early because I think sleep is of fundamental importance. Burning the candle at both ends ends in illness. So that's always a bad thing. But I get up early. I am productive from the get-go. Hydrate up, actually make a nice breakfast that's healthy. And then I start reading and then I journal and then I have my gratefulness. What am I grateful for? You know, what would make today great? Uh, I will do a couple of podcasts could be quick ones ft news briefing i find phenomenal eight minutes that just mean you don't need to look at the news for the rest of the day that saves you half an hour and then make sure you do exercise if i do exercise in the morning the rest of the day i don't have energy dips i don't overeat and then that just sets the day up and always have a plan for the day the night before so i have a not very sophisticated piece of paper that you know what's my diary What do I need to think about? Who do I need to impact? I wouldn't say I visualize the day. I think that's overstating it, but that would be a great thing if I had the time to do that. But just making sure that I understand what my priorities are, that I've scheduled my priorities, that I'm not deviating, and it works for me. And it's much, much better than jumping out of bed, you know, rushing your breakfast, not really having a plan and feeling lethargic. Now you were talking about the difference between being intentional and not being intentional. It's so easy to not be intentional, right? Just to go from thing to thing to thing. You know, you talk about exercise. 
my wife will know if I've exercised or not that yeah. day. She's like, yeah. I could see you didn't exercise today. Didn't yeah. get your run in today. I was speaking with someone else earlier today who said the same thing. It's like, gosh, you know, you just have to really be intentional about exercising because if you don't, you know, mental health is a real issue. The stresses that we yes. have to go through every single day, real issue. Struck me as a very important takeaway that part of the way you cultivate your mindset is being intentional and by really. Yeah. And a big part of my mindset is books. So I've always got two or three books on the go. I'm obsessed at the moment with the meditations of Marcus Aurelius, the Roman emperor. I think they are absolute gold dust. I just am gobsmacked that individuals 2000 years ago were so intelligent and knew more than we did. People think there's this linear advance of civilization, you know, and we're better than they were. That is just not true. They were sharp. And that bloke was very sharp. Are you reading The Daily Stoic? Absolutely. I'm actually into the meditations at the moment. I've read a lot around Stoic philosophy, and I think that's very powerful. You know, stay humble, focus on the things you can control. I really try and avoid things I can't control. What is the point of getting upset about things I can't control? Note them, but, you know, don't get drawn into them. It's the diversion of energy for no great reason. As an organization, actually, we are very much into what we control and accepting what we can't you know, market conditions or whatever. We need to understand the market conditions. We certainly can't change them, but how do we react to them? And can we react quicker than our competition? I find that quite exhilarating, actually. I think that is a critical thing in terms of mental well-being. People who operate with a rear view mirror. So they're always looking backwards at things they could have done, should have done, didn't do, regret. I just think it's pointless. I read a book recently and it talked about I think it might have been um, Keith Cunningham who wrote a very good book called The Road Less Stupid, which I really enjoyed. And actually, I'm getting all our senior directors to read at the moment. And one of his chapters was, how do you play the second half? I'm a football soccer fan. You're 6-0 down at half time. There's not much you can do about that. How are you going to play the second half? And I think that's vital, is making sure you focus on, right, what can we do from here? The situation might not be ideal. It might be less than ideal, but there's no point worrying about the situation. There's no point wishing we'd done something to avoid the situation. What are we going to do from here? And the exercise and the diet and the hydration helps you because it makes you less stressed and reactive. You know, as a CEO of a big company, you get bad news, but there's no point overreacting or reacting emotionally. You just create a bit of distance. And- how we react in that moment depends upon how we've developed ourselves up until that point. You're talking about Marcus Aurelius, who's, you know, one of his famous quotes was, you know, our lives are what our thoughts make it. So the things that yeah, we think, the absolutely. mindset that we create and so forth. I want to go back to something you said several minutes ago, because it's really kind of stay with me. And you were talking about in that moment when you're in the hospital and you were in 10 seconds, you know, 20 seconds, you decided, you know, what you wanted to do. And you said, people really know what they want to do, but sometimes they don't do it. So two questions here. One is around, How do people find their purpose if they don't know what it is? And the second thing is, if they do know what it is, how do you encourage people to be decisive and to take action on it? Because a lot of people live in fear. They might look back, like you said a minute ago, they're looking in the rearview mirror, they're afraid of what's going to happen if I do it. If people don't have their purpose, how do you recommend that they find it? And then how do they be decisive around it? Yeah, great questions. Not many answers. I think it's a lot easier to handle all that stuff if you've got support networks. So no one person can handle everything. No one person can do things by themselves. It is about the team. Now, the team might not be necessarily people you work with. I mean, my mother's 80 years old. She's as sharp today as she ever has been. She gives out free advice. So, you know, I speak to my mom every day. Until recently, I had this mentor I spoke to every day. I've got people in the business who I'll sit down and say, what do you think about this? And they go, and it's not that the CEO is showing weakness. I probably know what to do, but I want to bounce it off people in and outside the business to say, is this the right thing? I've been very lucky in so far as I've worked with people for a very long time. A lot of people in our senior team we've worked with for 20 years. A lot of my advisors aren't just advisors, they're friends. They know me really well. So they feel that they can ring me up and tell me you got that wrong. And I think that's really important that you've got feedback. You've got people who can give you feedback. And if you're on your own and you're making decisions and you've got no support mechanisms, I think it's really tough. But there are ways of cultivating those um, relationships almost. And I think the Dale Carnegie book, which was a pivotal book in my life in terms of reading it, 
I was a very technical accountant. I love the technicalities of accountancy, but I was hopeless with people. Some people would say I'm still hopeless with people, actually. And I'm quite task focused. But actually, I realized that to be successful in business, say, I'm pretty well anything, but in business, you've got to have people around you. And, you know, the golden rule, treat people as you'd like to be treated yourself. I mean, we talk about that all the time in our business and doing things for other people with no expectation you're going to get anything in return. Now, in reality, of course, you do get something in return. You get, you know, loyalty, friendship, really important things. And, you know, some of the things that I'm really proud of is in London, I've got a financial PR man and me and him have been working together for 20 years. And actually, he came to me, I don't know, eight years ago and said, I've always fancied setting up in business myself. And I said, well, I really like people setting up in business myself. That's what we did. If you move and set up your own business, we'll be your first client. And we were. And he's now got a great business, one of the great financial PR firms in London. He's grown with his partners himself. And I think if you're inherently selfish and you find yourself alone, it's a very, very sad existence, I think. And I think the Carnegie book was instrumental in there are ways and means of being with people. And it's not about manipulating people. It's about just being genuine. And I think people, if you're genuine with them, we're genuine with you. And I think that is vital and showing an interest in people. You know, if something's troubling somebody or somebody suffered a death. It happened to me today, actually. One of our senior people just had a bereavement in the family. And we just spent 20 minutes discussing the impact that that person had had on his life. And it was lovely. And I learned a lot about him. And it was fascinating the impact that it had and I mean before I'd read the Dale Carnegie book 20 years ago that just would not have happened that would have been into my tasks and my lists and it would have been a wholly inappropriate exchange of <laughs> communication but you know you've just got to sometimes slow down really to speed up I think that's another really important thing you've got to build the relationship equity and the trust that relationship in order to actually work and the great thing about our business is we've got people who've been here for years and years who are still motivated and we're all one team and we know when something's wrong because it's quite clear something's wrong. You've developed great relationships with people. I mean, you know, frankly, if we think about like what's really important in life, it would seem to me that one of the main purposes of life is connection with other people, relationships with other people. It's a lonely life. Mm-hmm. If we're just focused, like you said, if we're selfish, you're focused only on ourselves. It seems like we always get back just by giving, right? I mean, you took a lot out of the Carnegie book. So it sounds like Dale Carnegie helped you develop maybe some empathy. Oh, no, I was a classic task-focused accountant who thought everything was in the numbers. And I was quite disparaging, actually, of people. So I was quite, I think, arrogant, actually. And I realized, actually, no one wants to work with somebody like that. Somebody who's technical, no people skills, and a bit arrogant. That isn't really a great thing. And actually, my best friend who actually gave me the book, Dale Carnegie, he knew I needed it, actually. (laughs) I mean, you can read the book. It's hard to do everything in that book. (laughs) You know, don't criticize. Criticism comes quite naturally to me. Actually, I am quite good at it. But it just doesn't work. And not just at work, at home with, you know, I've got three kids and there's no point in criticism. My 13-year-old boy, he'll just react and I'll get nowhere near where I need to get to. And that I don't always succeed in that, I have to tell you. You know, we say that the, a lot of the principles and ideas, it's common knowledge, but not common practice. A lot of times we know these things, but they're hard. I'm a recovering perfectionist. That's not easy. I have the superpower of being able to identify problems. You know, that's a horrible thing in some ways. <laughs> yes, I know exactly what you mean. Yes. In fact, I visited a dealership yesterday in Scotland. The director said, I told them all before you came here, we think this place looks pristine, but he'll find something in the first two minutes. And there it was. <laughs> There he was, the wall with white marks on. <laughs> but you did it. You talked about it probably in a very friendly way, I'm sure, right? You were empathetic. Yeah, because or- if you're the CEO or if you're a senior director in a company, I think what you've got to appreciate, and again, it's hard, is just the impact you have on people, positive and negative. You can either leave them up and encouraged and enthused, or you can make one offhand comment and they're destroyed. The higher up an organization you get, the higher the responsibility on that because you can have a massive impact on people. And our job is to elevate people, isn't it? Is to make them fulfill their potential, to take opportunities, to give them confidence, to go and do great things. 
And actually, if you manage that in an organization, you can unleash that power. The organization is much better off for it as opposed to clamping down and having a, the reverse, which some organizations excel in. The great news is no one, no baby is ever dragged out of the womb and they lift it up and they say, here is a born leader. And it never happens. It can be learned. Everyone can improve their leadership skills. And the good news is there's plenty of books. You know, John Maxwell, Dave Anderson, Stephen Covey, Dale Carnegie, Jim Rohn. I mean, I've got a five-hour Jim Rohn audio at the moment, and I'm listening to it on my runs. This is dynamite. Very funny as well. I find it very entertaining, but it is just dynamite as a way of getting your morning mindset right. I mean, you don't need to worry about the day when you've had 30 minutes of him in your ear. What are some strategies that you've used to help people become stronger leaders at Virtue? Well, we've got a lot of development programs. And actually, these are very good for identifying people who lack confidence. So they've got talent, but no confidence. So we put them out early. We have a systematic talent profiling. So we identify the nines. And then we put them on 12-month courses, very practical in some respects. For the management, it would involve Dale Carnegie, actually. You actually do a lot of our training and have done for 10 years. It aligns with our values and it aligns with how we do business. So after 12 months, they've got a lot more confidence and they tend to get promoted. And that happens all the way through the organization. So we've got this constant pipeline of talent coming through. And the good news is these are people who, if we hadn't have had that explicit development path, would not have progressed. And in fact, I was earlier on in 2021, I think you've got this program in the US, Undercover Big Boss. Yes. Where you, you go into your business and you meet people and you're disguised and they don't know who you are. And I spent two weeks in April last year doing that program, the UK version of that program, and massive amounts of learnings, phenomenal experience, actually. The key thing I took away from it was we have some very, very talented people who actually want to get on, but are completely bereft of confidence. They don't actually see how they're going to get on and they don't think they're capable when they are. You don't spend much time with them to realize that they are. And what the reasons for that is, I mean, you could spend two hours discussing the educational system and lack of social mobility and all kinds of things. But it's our job as leaders of the business to tap into that potential of people so, for example, we've got, we're just taking on 120 18, 20 year olds, and they're going to work four days a week in the business, one day a week at college, and they're going to get apprentices through. They can then go on to degrees so they can go to effectively get a university degree. And that is helping bring our talent through. And then a lot of online training, including Dale Carnegie online training, which we've just invested in. So there's no excuse, really. And I suppose that's the flip side. If somebody comes to me and demands a promotion, which I always am a bit dubious about when people demand a promotion, and it seems a bizarre concept to me, but I find they haven't done any leadership management training online, which is open to all 6,000 people, then the answer is clearly no, isn't it? Because if they're not willing to invest in their own self-development, then why am I going to invest in them and promote them? So I think there has to be a double-edged sword here in terms of it can't all be incumbent on the employer to develop people. You've got to bring something to the party and you've got to show proactivity. And it isn't like there isn't stuff. You know, you can go on YouTube and find hours and hours of personal development, which is really valuable. So the question is, how much should we be responsible for trying to, you know, put stuff in them? I think you have to have a self-starting motor to some extent and actually want to do it. I don't think it's our job to sort of drag them around the bases of you know, it's not. I mean, you can do part of it, but, you know, we talk about taking command. So if I'm an individual within a company at whatever level, the question is, what do I need to do? I remember being young and junior in a company and reaching out to people. I One company reached out to the CFO and that wasn't probably something that people would do, but I wanted to learn and set up a meeting. And it also goes back to what you were saying earlier about mindset, I think, because, uh, you know, what is the mindset? If the mindset is, someone needs to do this for me, that's going to hold me back. But if the mindset is, I'm going to take 100% responsibility for my career, yeah. then, all right, I see opportunity everywhere. I think another interesting thought, which had a big influence on me, actually, probably in these explosive periods when we're making big decisions and trying to get the company running, 
is what is your mindset around it? Is it an abundance mindset or a scarcity mindset? Is the world a zero-sum game or is it a win-win? And I think that was really powerful. Once I realized that it was not a zero-sum game, <laughs> that actually, you know, just because I won didn't mean somebody had to lose, we can win-win together. I think that was a very powerful thought, actually. And that does change the way you approach things. Because, you know, if you get teams together, then there are nearly no boundaries. If you've got a very motivated team with a good plan and everyone's enjoying themselves and working hard, you can just do phenomenal things. Whereas some people have a very restricted mindset where, well, if he gets promoted, I'm not promoted. Does it matter to you? I've had some phenomenal arguments over the years with people saying, I don't know why you're getting upset by that, because because he's got promoted, doesn't stop you getting promoted. You know, there's plenty of opportunity here. You were fired, you know, and said, I'm going to find opportunity. Again, how we react and what that mindset is, it's not like you said, well, I guess that's it. I don't know what I'm going to do now. The world is full of abundance. There's opportunity. And at whatever age as well. I mean, that's the other thing. I mean, you know, I'm 52. I mean, I used to thought 52 was elderly when I was young. But I mean, I am, as far as I'm concerned, young. I mean, there's plenty of stuff needs to be done. If you think you can keep that mentality, then you keep young, don't you? My mindset is because I'm one year senior to you, 53, but 52, 53, that's the new 32, 33, (laughs) right? I mean, it's all relative, but you're right. It's it's about how we see it. So let me just ask you a little bit about the pandemic, because you've got this retailer, you get 130 stores in the UK. There's a period of time where you are shut down. And even when the government reopens, people are still reluctant to go back into dealerships. You know, and I remember watching an interview that you had about a year or so ago, and someone asked you about what your biggest surprise was. Hey, we were profitable. And in fact, I mean, your business has done extremely well in the pandemic. What have you learned about adversity and really how to overcome that Um, through the pandemic? Yeah, I think there's some massive learnings, aren't there? Never let a good crisis go to waste. I didn't enjoy the first week, I have to say. You know, closing a business down after 14 years was unpleasant. Putting 5,000 people onto furlough was deeply unpleasant. However, within sort of 48 hours, the senior team were at it. You know, we were continually communicating. We were unified. We had one plan. You just felt the energy of, right, we're going to do this. Right, go off, get your conference calls. And then it would just cascade down the entire business. And I think there were major learnings. For example, we decided we were going to pay people a lot more than the government said we should pay. (laughs) Because our view was, these people think they might die. (laughs) You know, there's a global pandemic. You know, we're going to have a 15% death rate. I mean, I worked out, you know, in the latest mortality rates in late March, that I was 5,000 people, I was going to lose 300. We lost, I don't think anybody, as it happens which is interesting in itself. So I thought, right, we need to make sure they've got no financial woe. Let's pay them so they're not worried about financials. And then we started communicating. So I was doing homemade videos in my back garden every 48 hours, and we sent them to the private email addresses of all 5,500 people. And the feedback we got from that was incredible because they were continuing what we were doing. We actually started reopening the business after three days, to be honest, because I realized stupidly, having closed the business down, that, you know, we actually have major service and repair operations, which were vital to keep the vans on the road and the nurses on the road. So we opened up actually quite quickly, but we were continually communicating with people because I think if people don't understand what's happening and there's a void, they always fear the worst. So communication, we've massively upped our game on communication ever since. And video, I think, is absolutely much better than email. So I was updating them on not just the business, but on the family. How are the family dealing with it? You know, what's going on in my life? And I think that really was useful, actually, for the whole business. The other thing is you don't worry about sacred cows when your back's to the wall. So there were things in our business which we'd wanted to change. And we've got our own in-house software company. We've got 50 software developers and we just pivoted software development for the business needs that came through the pandemic, being able to sell cars remotely, being able to do administration a lot more efficiently. You change the whole aspects of the business in months rather than wait 18 months and two years. And there was a lot of energy in that. And I think it was exceedingly beneficial. The other thing actually is, I mean, I was very negative 
about where the economy was going to be. I thought we'd see mass unemployment and social unrest. And I got myself into a bit of an interesting point on that one. But actually, when we came out of the pandemic, the fact that no one had been able to spend any money for two months and that the government had paid everybody meant there was an absolute pent up demand. And for cars, I think it was exactly the same in the States. No one was allowed to go on holiday. No one was allowed to go to a pub. No one was allowed to go to a restaurant. There's only two things you could spend your money on, a car and doing your house. So we just hit that purple patch. And actually 2021 was by far and away our most profitable year, by 50%. We've obviously benefited from a lot of the changes we made. I would be less optimistic around the prognosis going forward. I think that was a little bit of a bubble, but we're well prepared for the next phase and the impact of inflation, which will be fascinating. We look at the impact of leadership I mean, it was your leadership, your team's leadership that made decisions, made decisive decisions with a lack of information in many cases. You were probably surprised even that many people continue to buy online. You transformed the business digitally. So going back even to what we were saying earlier, kind of that preparation for leadership, it's the value of leadership that can help get through those kinds of crises. Yeah. And you've got to show confidence, haven't you? You have to absolutely overdo the confidence. So as the senior management team, and certainly as a CEO, we might not be rating the right decisions, but the right decisions at this point with the information I've got. So let's not worry about it. Let's just do it. And let's all face the same way. No point arguing amongst ourselves. Now, my team never argue amongst ourselves, actually. You know, we have debates, but we all got the same goal. It was really good that we just pulled together and you could just feel it, the ripple through the business. It was actually very enjoyable. Within two months, When we got on a roll and we had our plans and we were executing the plans, it was actually pretty enjoyable, if I'm honest with you. I didn't fancy the first month. Being closed was not my idea of fun at all. But getting on top of everything and having plans and seeing people starting to get not back to normality, because we've only just got back to normality now, nearly two years later, actually. Now we are normal. We are 100% free and we are 100% normal in this country, which is great. I've now got a full office. It's fantastic. I've got a full office of three or 400 people. I think people have had quite a tough time. You mentioned mental health before, and certainly we've had collateral damage in terms of mental health in our workforce. Some people have really struggled with the entire thing. And we're currently training all our general managers or store managers in mental health awareness. They have a full day course because it is that important an issue in our business at the moment, which is sad in many ways, but we've got to do our best to support that. But I think it certainly taught me a lot more about leadership, the importance of communication, the importance of being decisive, the importance of explaining what we are doing, why we are doing it, and why it's actually for the benefit of the business. I won't forget those lessons in a hurry. There's a lot of aspects. Communication matters, the trust matters, the decision-making matters, the strategy matters. So there's a lot of different parts of it. Let me ask you maybe a challenging question. I mean, how do you define leadership? If you were to put it in a sentence or two, how would you define leadership? Well, there's a quote. I think it's from a guy called Warren Bennis. And I'll probably misquote it, but it's uh, leadership is the capacity to translate vision into reality. I think that's a good definition of leadership because CEOs and leaders can stand up and cast the vision and this is what we're mm-hmm. going to do and this is how we're going to do it. And I'm very much into vision and values. I think vision, how we get there, values, how we're going to do it. But can you actually do it? Can you execute it? And execution is taking the bits of the vision, having a plan and making it reality. I think probably when I retire, hopefully one of the key things I'll look back on is that we had a plan in 2006 and we've got various stages of the plan, no doubt, but we have made decisions and made it reality, made decisions, made it reality. And that's what leadership's about, as well as doing it the right way, because you've got to have the values and you've got to have the ethics. And if I did have regrets on leadership, making the wrong decisions on values always comes back to haunt you. Making convenient decisions where you know somebody transgresses the values and you give them the benefit of the doubt and you don't take the decisive action, which probably everybody else in the organization is expecting you do, is a catastrophe and it never works out well. So actually I'm becoming less and less tolerant of such things as I get older because the impact on your integrity, you know, everyone's watching the leader as to how to respond to that. It doesn't happen very often, but when I make the wrong 
values call, you can bet your bottom dollar within two years, it comes back to bite me. Well, people see it, as you said, you know, and sometimes, <laughs> you know, I guess you could say you're trying to make the right decision for whatever the right reason might be at that time, but it does say something, you know, and it affects the culture. We talked about our mutual admiration for Alan Mulally, the former CEO of Boeing and Ford. And I know he's told me, he's emphasized, you know, the leader has to have zero tolerance yep. for anything that violates the values. Yeah. I mean, obviously Jack Welsh in his writings, you know, the hardest call is when one of your top performers violates the values, <clears throat> but you've got to make that call. Toxic achievers, a hard call, but you've got to do it. You cannot not do it. If you don't do it, you're on the slippery slope and They'll get arrogant. They'll know you've not done it and they'll come and do something worse. Every single time it happens. And it hasn't happened very often, but I've not enjoyed the experience every time it's happened. You're much better biting the bullet, I think, and upholding the values and your culture is stronger for it. Your business is stronger for it. I mean, Malat is right. I mean, you just can't do it. It just is pernicious within the culture. And I fundamentally believe that culture is fundamental to business. I mean, I'm an accountant. I can't even believe that I spend so little time actually looking at numbers and profit loss accounts. And I do all that, obviously, but not a lot. Because if you've got the culture of the business right, and people know the difference between right and wrong, and people are motivated and trained, then actually the profit and loss account should broadly take care of itself. Malali was an absolute genius, I think. And certainly I took a lot from his leadership in terms of business process reviews and things like that, which Ford is a great, great company. And actually, I was given a copy of, obviously, the famous Malali book by Ford. (laughs) They actually gave me a copy of the book. I did actually visit the chairman of Ford Great Britain and sat him down and said, I want you to just to talk to me about what is all this about and what are these business process reviews? And we took it to heart and we still really apply that methodology now in our business. I find it very, very valuable indeed. Well, it goes to things that you talked about, which is, you know, you talk about the team, it's all about the team, it's about integrity, it's about getting people to work together, it's about creating transparency. So it does tie together that business plan or review process, you know, so many different elements, but, but ultimately, like you said, it comes down to the people and the culture. Yeah, uh, I did actually meet Alan Mulally once, and it was quite an inspirational individual. You know, you really knew he just took time with people, he made people at ease, but clearly had a hard edge. And it was, yeah, very interesting. Actually. The author of the book, American Icon, yes. is uh, Bryce Hoffman. And Bryce had said, I mean, he described Alan as the iron fist in the velvet glove. You know, I mean, truly, he had zero tolerance and made the tough decisions. Indeed. And you look at what's happened to Ford Motor Company mm-hmm. now and Jim Farley. He's made a massive difference. I think it's really interesting, actually. If Jim Farley well, obviously spent a lot of time at Toyota, but he came from a Ford family. And he's got a passion for Ford Motor Company. And that's important. It comes across. He wants Ford to win. He's a Ford man. And you do need passion in business. The company has to mean something. It has to mean something to work here and believe in the values and believe in the vision. And you need that sense of loyalty. And that's why the leadership is really important, because people can lose that trust quite quickly if they see a dissonance between you know, what I say and what I do. It's not a good thing. No, trust is very hard to gain and very easy and quick to lose. Indeed. So it's our responsibility as individuals and as leaders to maintain that. Excellent insights. I really am grateful for everything you shared today, Robert. Is there any parting advice you'd have for our listeners? I would just like to actually thank Dale Carnegie. I mean, it sounds a bit sycophantic, really, but I think the book itself should be read by everybody who has responsibility for people. And actually, that includes families as well. I think it has a lot of see-through in terms of families. And it certainly had a massive impact on my life and I think has a massive impact on our business because we trade it. I think the work that you do in promoting the ethos of Dale Carnegie and the right values and the right way of treating people is just of fundamental importance. And in modern society, it's missing, actually, in many ways, in many aspects. So I would just like to thank you for that. And I might need to read it again. Thank you for the kind words. And we can all benefit from reading again, just a a very quick story. There's a story about a friend of Dale Carnegie's who was meeting him in a hotel lobby in the 40s. He sees Dale sitting in a chair and Dale's reading a book and he walks up, he sees Dale's reading How to Win Friends and Influence People. He said, Dale, why are you reading How to Win Friends? You wrote this book. He said, no one needs to read it more than I do. (laughs) So, (laughs) Actually, I'll just finish off on one story. So I used to have it by the side of the bed. 
Uh, it was by the side of my bed for 10 years. I always read it before I went to sleep. My wife was there one night. She says, why on earth are you keep reading this book? It's having no effect on you. You're as bad as you were before. <laughs> so there you go. You always brought down to earth. She said only as your wife could say it with love. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Robert. Really appreciate our time together. I know this is going to be um, very well received by our audience. I hope you enjoyed this edition of Take Command, a Dale Carnegie podcast. Check out our resources page at www.dalecarnegie.com for more research, insight, and tools that will support your success in taking command of your leadership potential. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating it and subscribing to us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. As always, thank you for listening. And we look forward to you joining us for the next episode of Take Command, a Dale Carnegie podcast.